Hello everyone, uh, welcome to When Tomorrow Comes. This is ICNU's regular look at the world of planning and development. My name is Dan Jestico, I'm ICNU's Director of Futures. I'm coming to you from a bedroom uh, in South East London and I've been coming to you from this bedroom for about the last year now, um, as indeed we all have. So look out next week where we're going to do a special um, anniversary vlog to discuss some of the things we've learned over the past 12 months. Um, but on to this week's subject, um, as you may have seen in your inboxes earlier this week, um, we've been talking about city centre pedestrianisation. And I've got three very special guests joining me on the virtual sofa this afternoon. We've got Piers Riley smith from King's Chambers. How are you doing, Piers? Very well indeed, thank you. There's blue sky outside of my window. Glad to hear it. Um, we've got Mike England from my senior transport team. How are you doing, Mike? Thank you, Daniel. You all right? Yeah, good to see you. Good to see you. Good. And we've got Justine Entizari from our Manchester office. How's it going, Justine? Hi. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, going, it's going well. It's uh, blue skies for me too, so <laughs> it's all good. Good. Happy days. I love it, blue skies. Spring's finally here. So, um, as is usual with these things, um, I'm going to hand over to Justine and Mike, who are going to take you through the, the sort of brief summary of our, of our Wednesday email from this week. Um, and over to you, Justine. Thanks, Dan. Um, so the uh, yeah the Wednesday email this week was about uh, pedestrianisation, um, specifically um, in response to the pandemic that we've um, obviously been living through for the last year. Um, so we've seen authorities across the country, uh, and Manchester in particular, um, bringing in special measures to allow businesses to kind of create outdoor terraced areas um, by closing off um, particular streets to vehicles. Um, and then also a couple of weeks ago, we saw um, Robert Jemerick um, announcing his plans to extend pavement licenses. So in the short term, there's really clear benefits to this um, in dealing uh, with the pandemic by, you know, obviously allowing outdoor um, service and social distancing to um, kind of abide by the rules. Um, but there's also clear other knock-on benefits, um, such as promoting sustainable travel um, and enhancing air quality um, in areas which were obviously previously dominated by vehicles. Um, so uh, pedestrianisation schemes, um, if they are kind of retained and promoted beyond the pandemic period, which I think it's, you know, we're seeing more and more plans to do that. Um, you know, we think we, these can all, this can also really help cities potentially adapt to the post-COVID world as, you know, they may become more uh, leisure-focused centres. Um, we've, seen, uh, we've seen some examples in Manchester, also, also Newcastle. I think Newcastle Council are unveiling their plans to pedestrianise um, a couple of streets. I think it's Grey Street and Blackett Street, I think, um, to promote that area as um, a cultural hub. So uh, al alongside these clear benefits, and um, we also talked in the email about um, a couple of potential negatives uh, if the schemes are not kind of well thought out uh, and executed, um, such as kind of ensuring that buildings can still be adequately serviced. Um, also, I guess, ensuring disabled access, access for the elderly. Um, Manchester Council uh, recently faced a legal challenge by uh, Diamond Buses. Uh, who claimed that their plans to pedestrianise Deansgate were not properly consulted on and would see uh, buses kind of rerouted through um, residential streets, which, they, you know, they didn't feel was appropriate. Um, I think probably other authorities are facing similar issues as well and, and push back against some of their schemes. Um, there, there'll, there'll also be uh, kind of winners and, and losers whenever, uh, you know, schemes to pedestrianise areas are implemented. And uh, the, actually the idea behind the, the Wednesday email this week um, came from a conversation that I had with a client of ours who, um, who owns a really successful bar in Manchester. And I was asking him if he was looking to expand or you know, um, sort of pursue any other new sites. And his view was that it would be far too risky to, to look at any more opportunities at the moment until there was absolute certainty over future pedestrianization because potentially picking the wrong site on a street that wouldn't benefit from that could, you know, could have kind of significant disadvantages. Um, so it's, uh, yeah, I just thought that that was really interesting because I, I kind of hadn't thought about it like that. Um, I, I guess the, the uh, email also touched upon um, kind of some of the conflicts that are taking place in cities and Manchester in particular being kind of really proactive in pursuing their plans for pedestrianisation, but then also promoting uh, a really controversial car park application at one of the uh, most contentious sites in the city, which I'm hoping we will 
um, hear a bit more about from players. <laughs> I think that's probably, I think that's probably, yeah. Okay. A bit of a brief summary. <laughs> yeah, great. So, Piers, over to you. Tell us a bit more about this car park controversy. Yes, what a teaser from Justine. So, <laughs> it, 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 you may have seen it. it. It made the news both local and national in that Manchester City Council granted themselves a, a permission, and they did grant it themselves. They were both the developer and the owner of the site for about a 400 space car park right in the centre of Manchester. Now, actually, the legal error that was eventually earlier uh, this year uh, held or found by the High Court um, was that the council had, um, in judging the impact that this would have on air quality, resurrected the ghost of the demolished retail park and said, well, there'll be a number of trips associated with that. This car park, when we develop it, is going to create the same number of trips. Therefore, there's a neutral impact. And of course, quite obviously, the High Court found that resurrecting that ghost to assume that there'd be no impact on air quality, um, despite there being, uh, apart from the car park permission, no ability to reuse the retail park, um, they found that to be unlawful. That was the legal error. But what was almost more interesting for, for this discussion uh, were the comments and observations made by the judge about the wider policy context that Manchester has. So they have a very clear local plan policy to improve air quality. This site was in an air quality management area. And all of the actual greater Manchester local authorities, um, they've all adopted something called the AI, sorry, the IAQM guidance, which I think uh, for fans out there stands for Institute of Air Quality Management Guidance. And they needed to follow that. And in this case, they hadn't. And what all of those things fed into was it's important when you're looking at proposals for development in air quality management areas in a city centre that you actually properly look at the effects that will have on air quality. And in particular, and this was sort of the ending observations of the judge in the judgment, where it could have adverse effects, as we know, on, on children in particular. And there have been a number of recent high profile cases about the impact air quality has on children, all of that heightens the importance. Now, what has that got to do with pedestrianisation, um, some will ask. Well, that focuses us back on why it might be important and the need for it, and how actually the promotion of pedestrianised areas might be in line with these entrenched and embedded policy, both local and national, uh, intentions. Okay, interesting. So, Mike, coming to you now, I mean, Justine touched on, on some of the, 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 the and, and, and Piers touched on some of the critical issues here relating to the potential servicing and air quality impact. Are there any sort of new and innovative solutions emerging that will kind of allow us to have our, have our pedestrianising cake and, our, and, and, and eat it in terms of being able to kind of service our restaurants and our shops in our pedestrianised areas? How do, how do we kind of you know, address these kind of concerns? Yeah, so there's there's lots of initiatives coming forward that sort of look at trying to sort of uh, enable um, more sustainable travel um, and pedestrianisation of sort of city centres to come forward. Things like sort of cargo bike deliveries and, and the like, so that you haven't got these sort of large vehicles that are intimidating on our sort of uh, main sort of pedestrianised streets and things coming forward. Um, it is, it is sort of initiatives like this that uh, we need to look at because, as we know, places like Greater Manchester, they've got a, a, an ambitious strategy in place to sort of try and achieve 50% uh, of sustainable uh, travel to occur all journeys by 2040. So wherever we can sort of get pedestrianisation uh, and things happening, it, it, it all adds up and helps sort of thing. Um, we know that the sort of COVID pandemic um, has given people sort of a little bit of time to sort of reflect on uh, their daily travel habits um, and things like sort of working from home and home deliveries and everything else is sort of coming forward. Um, and therefore, I think why not? Why not sort of people sort of jump on the initiatives like this and sort of try and influence, um, you know, how, how journeys are sort of undertaken, really? Okay. I mean, from, in, from a, for a kind of an operator's perspective, Justine, turning to you for a second. Are any of the, 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 your clients um, 
sort of say, are they embracing any of these forms of sort of new and new ways of servicing these cargo bikes? I mean, I can't imagine that there'll be many sort of um, bars or cafes out there looking to get all their all their beer and wine delivered by cargo bike because um, it's jolly heavy. I mean, how how sort of how how do we expect the the, the tenants and operators of these these pedestrianised spaces to operate in a in a space where they can't get any um, vehicles to the front door? Yeah, I, I, I think that, that that is potentially going to be an issue, as you say. I think it's, uh, you know, there's some there's some huge benefits to it. Um, but I think I think servicing the buildings is going to be a bit a big issue. I, I don't know if if there's a, you know, a potential solution whereby you have part time pedestrianisation. There's particular periods that you, you can access the buildings for servicing. Um, I'm not sure. I think we, we need to see some really innovative solutions to that um, because we, we can't we have to make it work. Yeah. Okay, and Piers, there's a, there's a certain sort of delicious irony in a in a bus operator taking legal action against the city <laughs> council in trying to pedestrianise. You know, you've got one form of sustainable transport trying to trying to derail another form of sustainable transport. That strikes me as being a bit of an odd one to try and resolve. How, how do we get around these sorts of issues? Well, it, it, it's really interesting, and, and in fact, that case. Um, no judgment was published. They sort of settled out of court, as I understand it, before it ever went there. But one, this tension which you talk about is increased by a few days ago, of course, Boris Johnson announced a three billion investment in buses and really focusing on new bus routes. So how's that tension going to be dealt with? I think it's partly reflexive or reflective of the point that um, pedestrianisation will not be appropriate for everyone. Uh, there may be people who, due to age or disability, can't, uh, you know, it limits their access to the streets and therefore the importance of, and I think this was reflected in actually that bus operator and, their, and the challenge and the lack of consultation. A balance needs to be struck between different types of sustainable travel. It is not appropriate to just say, well, we pedestrianise everything, because that will, I think, and it's been reflected, you know, in that bus operator's challenge, it's been reflected, and I know we're not here to talk about it today, in some of the issues arising out of active travel neighbourhoods, that pedestrianisation will not be appropriate for all and could actually exclude. So I think we are here today to talk about the benefits and the opportunities of pedestrianisation, but that's not, it, it's not in entirely green fields and, 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 and flowers. There are some issues with it too. No, exactly. It, it, and so my experience of it, it, it tends to work very well when it's been established over time. So where there's that already extensive precedent, I'm thinking of your, your sort of Ramblas in Barcelona, where it's the whole thing's pedestrianised and there's no car for, for a mile. And, you know, if, it's, if, it, if you can deal with it in a city like that, then surely you can deal with it on a smaller scale in, in some of our sort of congested urban locations. Um, so Justine, just, just turning to you and then, and then my compares, if I may, for a final summing up. Um, question to, to, to debate really is, will, will uh, the temporary pedestrianisation that's been introduced to, to, to bolster the, the post-Covid economy, will that be a permanent fixture, yes or no? Ooh, I, I think yes in certain places, but I think it also requires people to change their mentality. It's not just about having pedestrianisation in, in, in a particular spot and just pushing the problem out elsewhere. We need to change people's thinking about how they travel. Um, but I think, yes. <laughs> Mike? Yeah, I mean, as has been sort of touched upon um, by others, uh, they need to be considered appropriately. We, uh, we spoke about this previously on a previous blog when we spoke about uh, LTNs. Um, it needs to be the right area. It needs to be the right sort of method and strategy. Um, but I think we can go from this sort of temporary situation where pedestrianisation is implemented and take that forward for a more sort of permanent solution uh, and get people to sort of buy into it along the way. Um, very good agreement so far, Piers. Are we going to go for three for three? No, I'm going to add in a, a drop of pessimism, which is um, one thing to bear in mind with your Barcelona example, um, weather sounds like a very trite point, but it is of interest that where, you know, uh, shops have been able to open again and pubs and restaurants and payment licenses, that has echoed with lockdown times when the days are longer, when the, 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 the sky is nicer. You know, I started by noting the surprise of a blue sky. That's because I'm in Manchester and a blue sky in Manchester is really worth commenting on. 
So <laughs> it's not just about changing behavior. It is on a rainy, dark November night, are people going to want to be walking everywhere rather than jumping in a cab and things like that? We can change behavior, but I think we've also got to recognize our geography. And, and that will be my uh, drop of pessimism I'll add into the mix. Yeah, no, that, that's a really good point. You certainly don't want to be getting soaking wet when you go out for your, your night out, um, of which we are looking forward to many. So um, I'm going to wrap up by thanking our guests for this week, Piers Riley-Smith, Mike England and Justine Entazari. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Cheers, thank, thank you. you. Cheers. And we look forward to seeing you all again soon. Cheers. Bye-bye. Cheers.